Revelation chapter 3, and uh, we're going to finish out the church age. So that, pe that, that piece of notes that's been in your Bible for two months, you're about to be done with it. And uh, we're going to move on. And I spent a little more time than I really thought I would or even wanted to in the churches, but I think it's good to, to build a foundation and uh, make sure and explain things well. And, and so we're on the church age. We're in the very last section of it. And I left my clicker at home. So, Jax, if you'll go to the very next slide. Okay, then go to the next slide. Um, we're, we're working on this church age here, and we've worked our way all the way down to the last church. And we're using, of course, Revelation 2 and 3, which are letters that John wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to remember, he wrote those letters to uh, real, live, actual, local churches. And those letters were meant to be a word from the Lord to these churches uh, in, in some in some cases, commending them for their their good works and commending them for what they were doing right. But in many cases, as we've seen, um, you know, churches aren't perfect, and they need uh, they need uh, condemnation as well. They need some encouragement, uh, admonition as well. And I, and I was thinking even today, you know, if the Lord showed up at Central Baptist Church or He had John write a letter to Central Baptist Church. Um, I would hope there'd be a lot of commendation in there. I'd hope that there'd be a lot of good things he could write. But, you know, as, as church and people, you, you know, uh, up to the standard of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we probably aren't going to be found perfect, are we? As, just as people, uh, as, as a church. And so our, our striving would be that we would be the type of church that the Lord wants us to be. So we look at these churches as an example of what types of churches there can be. And so, it, it, again, I've been saying this, but three different ways we can look at the letters. Um, they all work together, so you don't have to pick one, but it's letters to churches to help us to know what types of churches there are, and then the types of churches that can be in any age. Okay, so there can be um, Smyrna-type churches. There are persecuted-type churches in our day-to-day. -day. Um, there can be churches like Philadelphia or Thyatira, the, the different things that the Lord says about each one can be present in churches today. And then thirdly, uh, we looked at this as a walk through church history. And this is just something that you can look back at history and understand that how the church has gone over the last 2,000 years is a mirrored reflection of what's written in chapters 2 and 3. And we haven't even gotten into really, I mean, we've gotten into very, very little of the actual history, but... As we're walking through our study, we're putting this timeline together. I just want you to see that um, while the prophets didn't see the church age, because you read like Daniel, he didn't know anything about the church, right? His, his writing doesn't include the church. But in the New Testament, it's, it's more or less all about the church. And in the book of Revelation, we have that continued timeline from the time of Christ all the way into the rapture dealing with the church. So the time we live in is this dispensation of grace or the church age. And tonight, we're looking at this period from about the mid-1800s uh, to the present. Okay, so this church is Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Now, look at Revelation 3. Let's read it together. We'll start there in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Isn't that interesting? Just pause for it. Isn't that interesting that God was saying, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. We're going to get into that a little bit. Um, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest. So now he's going to break down what the problem is. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
So we're coming off of this time of Philadelphia, which was about 350 years of some of the greatest revival uh, really our world has ever seen uh, with the gospel. So a lot of things happened in that church age, but one of the things that happened is that the true church was always going along. Of course, we've We've seen that just from the time of Jesus. There's always been a true church, a true line uh, that has always stayed true to the gospel and true to the word of God. And, and they're going along and they're preaching. But in the 1500s, um, a lot of people left the false church in the Reformation. And, and they also started preaching the gospel and, and started preaching out of the, the correct scriptures. And, and so this thing happened where all of a sudden you had this great revival and we looked at it. I'm not going to go back and re-look at it, but we had this great revival from about 1500 until about the mid-1800s. In the mid-1800s, uh, uh, some things happened. And so, you know, it's kind of like, why 1881, right? Why are we specific about 1881? Or why am I specific about 1881? Well, it's not to say that the church was doing good in December 31st of 1880, but then January 1st, 1881, they just went, you know, and, and all of a sudden we have Laodicea. It's not that. But in the mid-1800s, and, and again, I, I'm gonna, we're going to tread just a little bit into history, and then I'm going to get right back out, okay? Because I, I, I want to go that way, and that's not where the Lord wants us to go. So we're going to just, just dip in, dip out. But in the mid-1800s, um, there were a couple of texts found, okay? One was found in the Vatican in the library. Uh, it's called the Vaticanus text. Uh, the other was found, I can't remember exactly where it was found. It was found in the late, eight, like in the 1860s, and it's called the Sinaiticus. Okay, these two texts, um, if you look in your Bible, has anyone ever been reading and there's a little footnote there and you say, okay, what does that footnote say? And you look over and it says, these words were not found in the oldest manuscripts. Or these words aren't found in the, most trusted manuscripts or the best manuscripts. Um, I've seen that's in my, I love my Bible because of the format of it, but I hate the footnotes because in this Bible, the footnotes are, that's all they do is just, just, you know, look, look in your Bible later at Mark 16, look at the latter portion, the last nine verses or so. Everyone's Bible in here will have a footnote that says these verses aren't supposed to be in your Bible. And they'll say they, they go with, the reason they don't think they should be in your Bible is, uh, well, they're not in the, quote, oldest or best manuscripts. The manuscripts they're referring to are manuscripts that were found in around 1850, 1860, the mid-1800s. And those manuscripts, and again, I'm just dipping into the history, but if you study the manuscripts, which you can today, if you study them, what you'll find is they disagree with the Texas Receptus, which is what our Bible is translated from. They disagree with it um, hun uh, tens of thousands of times. And what you find out is those manuscripts came from those manuscripts that uh, Origen wrote hundreds of years ago. And if you remember Origen, we talked about him a little bit. He was one that didn't like the deity of Christ or the virgin birth of Christ. And he didn't like, the, he didn't like a lot of things about the Bible because he changed the text 30,000 times. Now, you only have about 30,000 1,000 verses in your Bible. Do you think 30,000 changes would make a difference? Oh, it absolutely would make a difference. It changed the whole thing. Well, those two manuscripts they found, by the way, they weren't that old. I think they were probably fashioned in the 1800s, but they were based off some old texts that Origen wrote. But even if you read those, those manuscripts in the Gospels alone, so just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you just take those manuscripts, we call them Codex A and B, and if you read just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those manuscripts disagree with themselves 3,000 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They dis not, I'm not saying they disagree with our Bible. They disagree with themselves. So, um, and of course, one of them was found in the Vatican. And, you know, we trust everything that comes out of there, right? You see, th listen, all Bibles except the one we use came from those two manuscripts. Okay, that, when did that start? Revised Standard Version, 1881. The Westcott and Hort text was used. That text was brought off of those texts that were found. So what happened is not just this immediate switch from Philadelphia to Laodicea, but you have this church in Philadelphia that's on fire for God. They're, they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the true, unadulterated word of God. And, and what happens when that is occurring is revival. 
But what happens when all of a sudden the Word of God begins to be watered down in the Christian life? Right? What happens when all of a sudden it's like, well, i got to choose between all these different Bibles. Well, what happened was a lot of those churches started using these other Bibles. What happens when you water down the Word of God? What do you think happens to the churches? They get watered down. And so what we have, the result of that is, is a, you know, it took some time, but we find ourselves in this period of Laodicea, which, by the way, if you are paying any attention, that's the time frame in which we live today. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute, um, man, the closer we get to the Lord, the more and more and more our world looks like Laodicea. Now, am I calling our church a Laodicean church? Lord, I hope not. Right? No. We can be, I've said this, I've tried to say this many times, we can be a Philadelphian church in a Laodicean age. We don't have to succumb to the age, but I'll tell you this, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to be the right kind of church in the wrong kind of age. Because here is one section of Scripture where God has nothing good to say. There is not one piece of commendation in the letter that we just read. It's all bad. And so the Lord's coming down. He's saying, look, what I'm seeing makes me, he literally says it makes him sick. Verse 16. This is the time frame in which we use. So now we're going to look at this church because I think it, um, here, here's, where, here's where I'll step on my own toes. Okay, not yours. I would try not to step on yours. But churches are made out of what? People. So how do we get a lukewarm church? You said it, not me. Okay, right. No, no, it, right. If, the, if we're lukewarm, so will be our church. Amen? I'm not saying we are. I'm saying let's take this letter for what it is, a warning of the difficulty of living in this time. Um, as we look at this church, immediately when you read the letter, you find something different about this church than you would all the other churches. Look what it says in verse 14, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Right. Now, you may not have caught anything there, um, but go back to chapter 2, and I just want you to see how the Lord addresses all the other churches. He says of Ephesus in F chapter 2, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right, okay? When he refers to that church in Ephesus, he's saying he's, he's addressing a local church in a physical location, right? I'm going to write to the angel of the church of Ephesus, okay? So he could very well say, uh, if John wrote us a letter, to the angel of the church in or of Gillette. He could say that, right? He's just, he's just naming our location. Look, look at the next letter. Uh, it would be, let's look down to verse uh, 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna. You see that? Nothing weird there. Just, hey, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna. Right. Um, let's look at the next one. Verse 12. And the angel of the church in Pergamos. Right. Okay, he's just addressing these churches by where they are. They're local churches. He's, in, he's just addressing them that way. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 2, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira. Do you see the pattern? So he's addressing the churches. I want to write this church in this place. Now look down to Laodicea again, and you could verify chapter 3. The other churches, Sardis and Philadelphia, are addressed by their location. But look at verse 14 again. Unto the angel of the church, what does it say? Of the Laodiceans. Now, when it says of the Laodiceans, are we talking about the location or the people? This church is identified very differently. In fact, when Paul addresses this church in Colossians, he says, make sure that you, you send this letter over, that it, and he says, that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Now, Laodicea means justice of the people. So what we have is, I'm going to address the church of the people. Now just pause for a second. Does that not sound like 2023? I almost played you a video tonight. It's kind of humorous. It's a video called Me Church. And it's where people are just making ridiculous, like, hey, can we do this? And the pastor's like, yeah, you know, can I have a, if I come to your church, I want Super Bowl tickets. He's like, hey, just come on in. We'll get them for you. Or whatever it is. And I, I didn't play it because it makes, it, it's, it makes, it is funny, but it's not funny. Does that make sense? And, and because that's where we are as a, as a, Again, I'm not, when I say we, I understand it's so hard. But, and I'm not here to kick rocks at churches today, but we have to understand where we live because I don't want to become one of those churches. But, but the church is all about us today. It's the church of the people. The, the church of the people. 
Um, the Bible refers to it here as the lukewarm church. It's not hot, it's not cold. It's described in Scripture as being lukewarm. So they're not necessarily enemies of God. I mean, they're not trying to outwardly or with their mouths reject God, but it's like Romans 1 says, they, they have a form of godliness, but are denying the power thereof. Okay, so it's an empty thing. It's a, it's a we're going to do something, but it's not about you, it's, it's about us. And, and just to be honest, um, most churches in our country today are much less about what Jesus wants and much more about what the people want. I mean, I, I don't have any of these books because I, I can't stand to, they take up air space on my shelf that I could be breathing. And so I don't keep book, bad books that I don't like. But there's books out there that teach you how to build a church. And, and there's some, you know, I, I thought, well, meaning authors that, that wrote some of those books. And one of them is that whole purpose-driven series. And, and the, the way they tell you to build a church is you go into an area and you survey the area and you see what the people want. And then you build a church to suit what the people want. And lo and behold, you'll have a church full of people. Can I tell you something? It works. Because we got a lot of those kind of churches. But are those churches? Are, are we supposed to be like the world? Or, or are we supposed to be like Christ and have the world change to be like Christ? Well, obviously, you know the answer. Okay, so... This whole church of the people business, I mean, it's going on, it's going on like crazy. This, this attitude, it, it permeates our churches today. God told us it would be this way in the end times, and we do live in the end times, I believe. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So, um, oh, we're tired of all that teaching. You know, doctrine is just biblical teaching. The Bible tells us there's going to be a time when people won't endure biblical teaching. They don't want to hear it. Um, we're going to get into verse 17 and 18 in just a second, but I, it dawned on me one time because I'm thinking, okay, we've got all these churches out here that, you know, um, teach false doctrine. You know, I hate to be mean, but if you don't preach true doctrine, you preach false doctrine. I don't know how else, I really don't know how else to say it nicely. If you don't preach saved by grace through faith with no works, that's false doctrine. Anything other than that is going to be false doctrine. Anything other than that is going to send people to hell. So really the right thing to do is, is to point that out and understand, no, no, no. I mean, we might can argue about, you know, this, that, or the other, but these doctrines of the scripture, they're set in stone. We can't argue over them. They're, they're scripture. So I started thinking, okay, well, what we got here is we got, you know, some good churches and we got some churches who are preaching this false doctrine. But then it dawned on me, Jesus says they weren't, they weren't cold or hot. They weren't, um, it's not that they were labeling themselves enemies of God. It's not that they were outright preaching false doctrine. That would be cold, right? That'd be opposite of what God wants. They weren't that. They certainly weren't hot. They weren't Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches. They were lukewarm. Here's what that means. And again, they wouldn't endure sound doctrine. You're going to recognize this. There's a lot of churches today that don't teach false doctrine. I mean, they do, but it's like a, let me continue. They don't teach necessarily, the, the, the preacher doesn't get up and say, we're going to go over this false doctrine today. And they wouldn't say that anyway, but you understand what I'm saying. He doesn't get up and say, I'm going to preach to you about this type of salvation. He's not preaching true doctrine. You know what he's doing? He's not preaching anything. He's not saying anything. There's preachers, you can listen to them for an hour and they don't say a thing. Like they don't, they're not going to take a side. Why? Because that runs people off. Doctrine divides. Doctrine also unifies. It unifies those who will believe. It divides us from those who won't. But, but that, I, I just realized one day, 
man, that's what he's talking about, are, are these, these people who will get together and they'll say, listen, we don't, we, you believe what you want to believe. We're just here to love one another. And they have a, a facade of a service. And it's really just to appease the guilt inside them that they know they're supposed to go do something for God. So they show up and, and it's like, we'll just get together, but we're not going to say anything. Is anyone else getting this? This is, this is 2023, ladies and gentlemen. This is where, this is the, the, the field we're ministering. And I said this, because here, I know we're not a church like that. And I'm not here. I've been only in Gillette so short a time, I couldn't name you three other churches that, that are like that. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I honestly got enough to do just trying to keep my own self straight that I don't have time to go and throw rocks at them. I really don't. So I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say anything bad about anyone else. I don't even know. I wouldn't even know how to do that. But how does a church get that way? What's a church made up of? People. And what is taught and preached to us on a daily basis in our country, in our society today? Tolerance tolerance listen it's getting to where we can't even believe what we want to believe but but i mean so far it's like believe what you want just shut up about it right just don't just don't tell anyone else about it stop bothering us about it because you're hurting people's feelings it's it's you know you're you're i mean that's very judgmental of you to say there's only one way to heaven you see how, I mean, we are definitely living in this time. I mean, I, I could go on and on and on. I can get all worked up about it. I mean, I, I really, I can sweat through an undershirt over this. It really, I mean, because it, it, th this is the false prophet that's, that's told about in the Bible that, that like says all these things and appeases the ears. They say, peace, peace, when there is no peace, Jeremiah would tell us. And people go home and, oh, good, we went, to, we went to church. Now let's get on with what our life's really about. And those people will die and go to hell? Thinking I did my Sunday duty. Laodicea, church of the people. It's about what we want. And, and again, people come to churches, they're like, well, what, what do you have for me? What, what do you have for our kids? What do you... I'm glad. I'm so glad. I'm thankful for those that are in our church today. There's been some people come here and, and they really were concerned. What do you preach? What do you teach? What are the, you know, what do you believe about this or that or the other? I'm glad I've had some of those questions because I've had some, not, not here. I've had some come in and, and, and it was all about, you know, what are you going to do for us? What's the benefit of us coming here? I mean, basically what they're saying. When that's the questions I'm asked, as a, and I know, you, I know you might not agree with this, my, in my mind I'm going, go somewhere else. I mean, I, mean I, I feel bad saying that, that person's a soul, I get that. But if, if someone's coming to, to oh, what, what can you do for me? The, we we got to work on what church even is before we you know, get them in. And probably they need to be saved. So obviously the Spirit tells me, Psh, and I don't tell them go somewhere else. I tell them come on in and we'll try to disciple and, you know, we do what we can. But this is the church we live. I mean, this is the type of church that typifies our nation today. And this is the type of environment that we are ministering in. If you preach truth today, you are the bad guy. It's just how it is. You will meet those that will oppose you. Why? Well, because it's not about the people. It's the church of Jesus Christ in Gillette. It's the church of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. It's not the church of the Gilletteans, whatever that would be. That's not what it is. It's not the church of Jeremy either. Just be clear. It's his church. Well, I don't like the music. 
We're not worshiping you. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, people, I, and again, I'm not here to fight over music. We could, just, let's do it. No, I don't want to fight over music. But here's what I'm telling you. I just care if it's pleasing to Him. When, when we're doing everything because that's the way that we like it, we got to think a little bit about who are we trying to please and therefore who are we worshiping. Our world today is ate up with self. I, self, I've heard so much about self-care in the last year. I don't even know what that is, but I keep hearing about it. You're like, I, I got to have some self-care after this message. I, I hear you. Go do whatever that is. Well, then I'm in. So Jesus loved the church at Laodicea. I want you to know that. He loved the church of the Laodiceans. And he wanted, that, that's what he says there. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. We use that verse when we're, you know, preaching and, you, you, you know, you got some people there who aren't saved. So you're like, Jesus is knocking. Do you see the context there? Jesus is knocking on the door of the church. Can, um, hey, y'all, uh, Jesus says y'all, I'm pretty sure. Y'all, no, I don't want to be a rebel. Can I come in? Church, if you'll let me, is there room for me in there? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Isn't that a sad testimony? of the church that Jesus died for, that he's out there at the door knocking. <laughs> but he loves them. If you'll let me in, I'll come in, I'll sup with you. So he tells us three things. I'm going to go through these really quickly. I think you get it. I think we're already there. But he says, I counsel thee, verse 18, buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou may be rich. See, here's their problem. I'm rich and have need of nothing. Now, I could get into all that, right? We're all, according to the world report, by the way, we're all rich. According to the world report. Um, I, I doubt anyone missed all the meals today. I doubt it. I mean, I, I doubt it. But I know there's people in our world that have. Okay? Um, we're very, 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 very blessed people. Very blessed. Don't let that blind you. Don't, don't let that be some sort of weird evidence in your mind that somehow you're spiritual. Because that's what he's saying. I'm rich and have need of nothing. But God looks and says, no, that, those dollars in your pocket don't mean a thing to me. You need my gold. How do we get his gold? Well, uh, we could go through it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, you might write that down. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Matthew 19, 29. When we serve God in this life and we forsake our, uh, the world, we make those sacrifices and we serve God, uh, do things the way He wants us to do, uh, we will one day be at a judgment where our works will go through the fire. The fire will try our works. Again, He says this gold is uh, tried in the fire. So this is that sort of gold that goes through there and our works are, are either wood, hay, and stubble or they're gold, silver, precious stone. That's, the, that's what He's saying. Uh, that's what we need to invest in, the things of God. If we live our whole lives and we build up a huge bank account and, and we, and we you know, have all the stuff we ever dreamed of and we die and we get up there and everything burns up and turns to wood, hay, and stubble, we will, I guarantee you we have failed. Remember that church back there at Smyrna? They were physically impoverished. But God said, to me, you're rich because they were willing to lay down their lives for the cause of Christ. So buy gold from God. The second thing is we need some new clothes. Now, if we're rich and in need of nothing, uh, we don't need clothes. But the Lord said of us in, in, in just of our time period that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We need new clothes. He says that thou 
uh, by gold in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Again, this goes along with the same thoughts, but Revelation 19, 8 is a verse that you need to look at because the church, those who, uh, the, 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 they are they're arrayed in this fine linen, Revelation 19, 8, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, and that righteousness of the saints is not our own, but it's Jesus Christ's righteousness, and that garment is built by how we live our lives. Again, it's part of that heavenly reward. So he's, again, he's just saying, don't, don't let this world's good get in, in the way of your spiritual need. I'm not saying if you don't, you know, you're like, well, I, maybe I ought to go home and, you know, burn the boat. I'm not saying that. Don't let it get in the way. Don't, don't let it make you think that that's how you are uh, right with God. Number, number three, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Again, they're, they're saying, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. I believe they would include God in that statement. Did you know a church can have a service without God? It happens all the time. blindness it's that self-deception we talked about on sunday the only really the only remedy for that's hebrews 4 12 getting into the scriptures i'm so thankful for the scriptures you know today i was and i i'm not i tell on myself a lot this isn't any sin or anything like that but i was just struggling with something today and you know the lord answered me through the scriptures he does it he, that's how he the thoughts and intents of the heart i'm so thankful he hasn't left us without his book. So practically this church was in need of great revival. Perennially, we find that this church was at present in every time period, and prophetically it is the time in which we live. We find that if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we could become a church that goes through the motions, but Jesus is on the outside, and we don't want to go there. <clears throat> um, all right, so Church of Laodicea, that's where we live. Um, Jax, if you'll go, I'm just gonna shut, I'm just gonna show you where we're at now. So we have now gone through this. Oh, here we go. So look, look at this real quick through Laodicea. Just click through these, Jax. Covers that time period. It's a lukewarm church. Uh, Church of the Laodiceans. Again, they say rich and have need of nothing. No commendation, nothing good to say, only condemnation. Again, we see this church everywhere. I think that's obvious. And here's, here's, here's my point tonight. Let's be a Philadelphian church in the Laodicean age. We're going to stick to the scriptures. We're going to preach the gospel unapologetically. We're going to hold to the doctrines of the faith that God has given us to hold to and and, and again, I keep saying this, the church is made up of who? People. So if, if we're going to be this type of church, the Philadelphian church, we got to be Philadelphian believers. we got to have men and women in our church that are holding to the doctrines of the faith and standing strong on, on the Word of God and not wavering and, and not, not, not just giving in to this tolerant thing that we're supposed to do these days. And so if we're going to be that type of church... It, it, yes, it'll come from the pastor in the direction for sure, but, but it'll, it will come from every single one of us standing in our place. So it's a warning to all of us. Now, in closing, now, Jax, hop to the next slide there, and then one more. Just want you to see what we've done. So we've done this. Now, we've gone through the church age, and just want you to see there at the cross, again, we dealt with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, they rejected Christ at the cross, so uh, their path, it just it is nothing uh, significant about that it goes down there, but their path goes down below the uh, timeline because they rejected Christ. And Romans 11 says, Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So we'll find Israel again when we get to the tribulation period over there, the gray box. But the church, our path is where well, the church was grafted in just after the cross. Jesus, of course, established the church 
during his life, uh, but then the church uh, really continued that work after the cross, so I can't really put the arrow on top of that, so it's where it is. The church persisted now for the last couple thousand years and continues to persist. And the next thing that we are looking for as a church is this blue arrow, which is the rapture of the church. So what we're going to do from here is we've looked at the history, quite literally, from our day back to the beginning. We've looked at all that. Now we're going to look forward. And so next week we're going to start with, and I'm going to look at it like this. We're going to look at the path of the saints in the end and the path of Israel in the end. Because there's two different paths. And there's, there's scriptures for both and instruction for both. But what we're going to do is we're going to continue following these two groups of people. And then the third group of people we're kind of leaving out is those that reject Christ. But you'll see their path along the way because they're, they're, they're part of the story too. Um, but we're really going to switch and, and go to prophecy. And we only have, you know, four or five weeks to get through those sections because we're just, we're not getting in depth. We're just building uh, the timeline. But anyway, that's where we've gone and that's where we're going. So we'll close out. Uh, right there. Let's be a Philadelphian church. Believe something. Jesus said, I were, I'd rather you be cold or hot than to be lukewarm. Well, I don't want you cold, um, so let's try to be hot. Let's believe what we're supposed to believe. Move forward for the cause of Christ here as the church of Jesus in Gillette. Lord, I thank you for these people that you've assembled and just for the church that you have called out here. Lord, I know that just like all these churches we've looked at, they had purpose and, and they had things that, that, that you wanted them to accomplish. I know that's the very same for our church. And uh, so, Lord, we pray that you would use our church in a great and mighty way in this uh, area. We pray that we would uh, just follow you. We pray for your wisdom and, and for you to help us with each step along the way. I certainly need uh, direction each day uh, for what you'd have us to do. We thank you for your word that clearly identifies the doctrine and, and the manner of teaching and, and, and church polity. We, we just pray that you'd give us the strength to stick to that. And uh, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to heed the warning because we just looked at seven churches and they were all churches just like ours, good churches. But then before you know it, things are happening that you're having to correct them on. And I just assume if, if they're, they can fall victim to it, so can we. And so... Lord, help us to just be aware of that and help us to stand strong in the faith that you've given us. I pray, Lord, you dismiss us with your love tonight. So thankful for the time we've had. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.